and I wanted to abandon the battlefield altogether, and I never wanted to involve myself in fitna and hardship and tribulation. He said, but one time my father complained about me to the Prophet ﷺ, not that I was disobedient to him, but that I prayed too much and I fasted too much and I read too much Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ told me to moderate my recitation of the Qur'an, moderate my prayer, fast less because you're going to burn yourself out. And then he said, Ya, Am, ya Abdullah, atar abak, O oh Abdullah, obey your father as long as he's alive. And so he said, I found myself in a predicament where I had to obey my father, but he said to Hussein, he said, I didn't throw an arrow. I didn't hold the sword. I just carried the banner. And Hussein radiallahu anhu forgave him. And they reconciled. SubhanAllah, look how complicated forgiveness can be. This whole time, had this conversation happened earlier, and Hussein may have known about a circumstance from Abdullah that would have made his heart soften towards him. Had Abdullah gone to him and forced the conversation, maybe it would have thought a little bit earlier. And there is the noble man of Abu Sa'id that sees two people that says, you know what, I'm going to take you and I'm going to make you sit with this person and I'm going to end this now. Forgiveness can be complicated. It can be very complicated. And it was harder on them than anybody else in some of these situations. SubhanAllah, what harder than for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu to forgive the man who slandered his daughter and to continue to give him sadaqah. What harder than that? A man who caused this much misery to you, to your daughter, to the most beloved person in the world, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But look what happened. Now what do we do in these situations and what's the balancing act? Because there is forgiveness and accountability, right? So what do we do when we find ourselves in some of these situations and recognize that sometimes it's not that simple. It's not simply just say salamu alaykum and hug it out in the masjid and it's over. Sometimes there is a lot that's happening in the background. There are three things that you take from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one is to try to find the redeeming factors of the person. What's redeeming in your relationship? When Allah Azza wa talks about divorce, وَلَا تَنْسُوا الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Don't forget the good times between you. And what are the redeeming factors? So for example, what was it with Mistah who slandered Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha? He was one of the people of Badr. What was it with, uh, what was it with Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a? A very intriguing story radiallahu anhu. A man who was from the veterans of Badr and who got caught in a weak moment and who wrote a letter when the Prophet ﷺ was going into Fatih Mecca, into the conquest of Mecca, wrote a letter to the Meccans in advance to inform them of the Prophet's plans, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not because he was a hypocrite, but because he didn't have any allies in Mecca. So if things didn't go right, he, was, he thought he was going to be apprehended and he was going to be the most vulnerable of the companions. So in a moment of weakness, he wrote a letter. Jibreel Alayhi Salam came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, told him about it. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Ali and Az-Zubayr and Al-Miqdad to catch the person who was on her way with the letter and intercept it. And when it came back to the Prophet Sallallahu imagine Hatib is in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Anhu, and look what you've done. You almost just compromised the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions. Why? And Umar Radiallahu Anhu says, he's a hypocrite, let me end him. And Rasulullah Sallallahu says, first of all, he's a person of Badr. He reminded Umar Radiallahu Anhu that no, he's a veteran of Badr. So there's something to him because people didn't come out to Badr that were hypocrites. They were good people, the best of people that came out to Badr. And he asked Hatib what happened, and Hatib said, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, I did not do so to put you in harm's way or anyone else, but all the other companions have people in Mecca that could help them out. If the battle doesn't go right, if things don't go right, they have allies, they have tribal connections. I have nobody, so if things were going to go wrong, I was going to be the most in trouble. So I got weak, and I wanted to just establish some sort of a link so that I wouldn't be vulnerable in that situation. He was held accountable, but he was also forgiven. So the first thing was thinking about something good about the person. What are the redeeming qualities of a person when you have that type of a, 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 a harm that takes place between you? What's something redeeming that I can think of in terms of their iman, in terms of their salah, in terms of their salah, in terms of their righteousness? Number two, number two, can I look at the circumstances of the situation and not justify the person's wrongdoing with the circumstances but still say the circumstances were difficult on that person and I can forgive them even though it's not an excuse. I'm not excusing the behavior. 
Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu and Al-Husayn radiallahu anhu. Al-Husayn is not excusing Abdullah ibn Amr, but he understands now a little bit more about the circumstances that he was in that maybe led him to that predicament. The Prophet sallallahu saying we can understand Al-Hatib as bad of a decision he made, the mistake that he made, the circumstances, there's room there from some, for some husn al for some good assumption, something to be extrapolated to give that person a means towards forgiveness. Number three, focusing on the greater reward. Number three, focusing on the greater reward. Let them forgive and let them pardon. Don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? So the first thing is finding something redeeming about the other person. The second thing is finding an excuse due to the circumstances without excusing their behavior in the circumstances. The third thing is Forgive and pardon. Don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive and pardon you? Now here's the other side of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to us about a situation in which a person is repentant, in which a person is seeking forgiveness. Allah is not speaking about the unrepentant transgressor, nor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about checking a harm that is still imminent to someone else. So you don't put someone in an abusive situation. You don't say about someone who does not seek forgiveness that we should forgive them, right? You can remove yourself from the prison of a grudge without still, you know, forgiving a person who hasn't sought forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still establishes an environment of accountability and this is actually the power of the Qur'an in this regard. As much as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pushing us to forgive and as much as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the repentance having a way forward, Allah does not use kind language towards oppressors and transgressors in the Qur'an, the way he uses it to a person who sins on their own and has their individual sins. The language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to oppressors is, don't think you're going to get away with this. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not see your wrong. Beware of wronging someone because it will be darkness for you on the day of judgment. So the language that Allah uses towards the person doing the oppressing and doing the wrongdoing is very harsh language. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply leaves a window of tawbah without speaking lovingly to that person. And this is something that some of the ulama mentioned. Allah speaks lovingly to the sinner in the Qur'an, calls them back to Allah. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, O oh my servant who has transgressed against themselves, don't despair from the mercy of Allah. But when Allah speaks to the oppressor, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَتَنُوا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُوبُوا فَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمُ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ الْحَرِيقِ Those who have harmed and put to trial the believing men and the believing women, and they don't repent. They have a way to repentance as well. But the language is a lot harsher. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put them into hellfire and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them severely. So there has to be an initiation. And if you are on the other side of that, do not let your arrogance and do not let your sense of immunity stop you from going and seeking forgiveness from someone that you've harmed. And do not depend on the other person's teskia to get you out of hell. That person might forgive you because they want a higher reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you still might be punished because you need to be forgiven by that person and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there's that balance of a higher incentive for a person to forgive and a higher sense of urgency to go seek forgiveness. Don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware. But dear brothers and sisters, it was complicated for the companions. None of these situations, none of these ayat that came down, none of these ahadith that came down ignored people's complexities. They just called us to the highest version of ourselves. And the believers always strive to be in the best position. And I end with this thought, subhanAllah. Was there ever anyone that could come to the Prophet and say that he wronged them and did not provide them any recourse? One of the proofs of his prophethood, in fact, that the scholars mention, is that as many of these things happen as, a nature, as, as natural as it is between human beings, not a single person could come to the Prophet ﷺ when he started his call and say, but remember, you still owe me this, and you still did this to me, and you did that to me, and you did this to me. Rasulullah ﷺ had no grievances against him. Even in the, in the heat of the climate, no one could bring forth a personal grievance against the Prophet ﷺ. Think about that. 
Think about that. May Allah free us from being grieved on the day of judgment by our own sins and transgressions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to get past our own grievances with a higher reward. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comfort us in a way that only He can comfort us. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ad al-Muslimin. Fa astaghfiru innahu al-Ghafur rahim